Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening for our colleagues in Indonesia and Malaysia, and good morning in US. On behalf of, of the Indonesian Society of Nephrology, we would like to extend our gratitude to ISPD for the opportunity to hold the joint webinar with Indonesian Society of Nephrology. This is the second webinar that will be focused on PD prescription and infection related to peritoneal dialysis. We are honored to have with us Dr. Susi Bu from US as representative of the Educational Committee of ISPD. And we have two speakers, Dr. Wan Haslina Wan Muhammad from KL, Malaysia, and Dr. Nima Dehustini from Jakarta, Indonesia. This session will be chaired by Dr. Atba Gunawan from Malang, Indonesia. Before commencement, Dr. Susi Hu will address the opening speech as representative of ISPD. Dr. Susi, would you please? Yes, thank you so much for the introduction. Welcome everybody um, to this wonderful session. On behalf of the ISPD, I'd like to thank the Indonesian Society of Nephrology for this collaborative effort to put out these um, informative webinar series. Um, it's a true pleasure to support this effort in expanding our knowledge of peritoneal dialysis. Um, as uh, mentioned, our first session was uh, last month in July, uh, where we discussed um, the reasons for why we would choose PD and also addressing uh, PD catheter issues. And this um, was uploaded um, to the ISPD website. A link was uploaded and um, has already been widely viewed, uh, over 300 views. Um, and so that we invite you to continue to participate. Uh, the next uh, couple of sessions will also be uploaded and be available to view uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Susi. Without wasting more time, I would like to ask Dr. Atma Gunawan to lead this webinar. Dr. Atma, please. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Aida, and thank you, Dr. Susi, and thanks also for ISPD and collaboration with Indonesian Society of Nephrology. Now we are on second webinar about PD in clinical practice. Uh, we have two expert or speaker from Malaysia, um, from Indonesia, from Malaysia is Dr. Wan Haslina Wan Muhammad, and from Indonesia is Dr. Nimadi Hustrini. So we have around one hour for this webinar. And the first uh, speaker is me. I would like to talk about the ethical aspect just for two slides. And then uh, next is Dr. Wat for speaker. And then Dr. Nimadi. We will have discussion after two speaker complete for speaking. And now we start. I would like to start uh, my slide, please. Okay, I can start from here. This what is ethical principle for health authority and dialysis care provider. An individual with end-state kidney disease should have access to the best available care in renal replacement therapy and supportive treatment. Health professional and policy markers should strive to reduce the cost of dialysis using simple, safe, and affordable modalities without compromising the quality of care provided to patients. Commercial competing interests on the part of policy makers and health service providers, including nephrologists, should be routinely disclosed to the public and patients. 
where rationing of dialysis resources is necessary and unavoidable, access to dialysis should be equitable. Physicians have an obligation to provide information about risk and benefit to dialysis and to support patients or the surrogate decision makers in qualitative evaluation of treatment options. Decision about initiation or withdrawal of dialysis should not be considered irrevocable. However, decision makers should be informed of the potential limitation of future options that could be the consequence of initial decisions. Policies and guidelines governing access to dialysis should strive to avoid futile treatment, promote equality of opportunity, maximize utility gains from the available resources, exclude criteria that are not morally justifiable with respect to allocation decisions such as race, sex, religion, or social status. Ensure transparency of policies and process. That's about ethical in uh, dialysis. And next speaker is Dr. Wan Haslina Wan Muhammad. She would like to present about PD prescription and clinical uh, practice. Please, Dr. Wan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Atwa, for the uh, introduction and uh, good assalamualaikum and good evening, everyone. And uh, with this, I would like to uh, take the opportunity to thank the organizer for inviting me to give uh, uh, the talk in this webinar. All right. So what can we go to the slides? Mas Ferdi itu slide-nya dari panitia atau dari Dr. Wan? Dari Dr. Wan, Dr. Oh, saya kena share lagi sekali ya. Oke, okay, sekejap ya. Oke. Okay. Yes. So, is it viewed? Yes, right? Oke. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about PD prescription in clinical practice. Uh, it's going to be very basic, um, but I would like to start with a case discussion. And I have to apologize because I have a difficulty to figure out how to do slidos in a PowerPoint. So it's going to be manuals and the answer we will discuss at the end of my lecture. So I have two cases. So case number one is about a 30-year-old lady. She's a teacher. She was diagnosed to have end-stage secondary to lupus nephritis. And she crash-landed to our hospital with um, uh, uremia, hyperkalemia, and uh, the bicarb uh, acidotic HB of 8.9. I'm sorry. All right. And the bedside ultrasound KUV uh, reveal a small kidney with poor corticomedullary differentiation. She still have good uh, residual uh, uh, urine, urine, kid, uh, urine, which is about more than 1,500 mils in a day. So we put him, uh, her, so she underwent urgent tank of insertion. So what initial PD prescription would you recommend? So I will give you a sec few seconds to, to choose your answer before we go to the next case. A, um, CAPD4 exchanges every day. B, automated uh, peritoneal dialysis, APD, about eight hours of treatment and a total volume of eight liter. Uh, or to give daytime icodextrin followed by two exchanges uh, in a six days in a week. Or put patient on partial dry day five days a week or CAPD three exchanges a day, five days in a week. Okay, I think you can, uh, all of you can get your answer now. So let's go to case number two. 
It's a 55-year-old man with end-stage renal disease secondary to chronic GN. So he was put on APD uh, every day for six months. His regime is four cyclists, eight hours treatment and field volume of 1,500 mils for each cycler. So every morning he will go for a five kilometer walk around his neighborhood. And during his follow up, he complained of tiredness and itchiness. And if you can see here that he has inadequate dialysis whereby the urea is 32, creatin creatinine is 870, potassium 5.0, HB is 8, albumin is 22. He still have a residual urine of more than 1,000 mils a day. He is euvolemic and he is compliant to the treatment. So what adjustment would you make to the PD prescription? A, at daytime dwell with 1,500 mils of icodextrate. B, increase number to five cyclers with eight hours treatment and maintain with 1,500 mils for each cycler. C, increase the number to five cyclers with eight hours treatment and increase uh, to 2,000 mils for each cycler or change to CAPD three exchanges a day. Okay, so um, in, in this session, uh, we are going to review on uh, the latest ISPD uh, recommendation on prescribing PD. Uh, I will focus more on initial, initial PD prescription, the principle, mainly the principle of incremental PD. Subsequently, we look at the follow-up assessment, revising prescription, and lifestyle modification that can actually um, uh, complement the prescription. So International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis recommended a high quality goal directed dialysis in which it's using shared decision making between the person doing PD and the care team. And it is aimed to establish realistic care goals that maintain quality of life for the person doing PD as much as possible by enabling them to meet their life goals. We, uh, it is aimed to minimize symptoms and treatment burden while ensuring high quality care is provided. So this is a, a nice pictogram uh, to differentiate, you know, uh, the recommendation ISPD uh, 2006 as compared to SIPD, ISPD 2020. So if you can see here in ISPD 2006, the prescription is more focused on small solute removal, which they aim the KTOB is more than 1.7. However, high ISPD 2020 high quality go directed focus more on shared decision making which involve the per person, caregiver, and also the PD team. It considering the uh, prescription with a patient characteristic, whether, whether they are uh, old, frail, you know, uh, ch uh, children, and uh, the local resources, person lifestyles, caregiver wishes. And also, it is also look at the limitation in in a low economic regions and it aims to preserve residual kidney function and the assessment is focused more on health related quality of life followed by clinical which is volume status nutritional status and small solute clearance so for prescribing a pd initial pd prescription the principle is that we should prescribe uh, it is ideally to prescribe, the prescription should be individualized. It should tailor to patient lifestyles, patient body size, patient's residual renal function, uh, patient peritoneal membrane type, volume or ultrafiltration requirement, and also solid clearance requirements. And uh, PDS changes can uh, be delivered in, uh, through either continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis or automated peritoneal dialysis. So the utilization of the PD modality is depends on uh, the local resources, um, depends on the availability and also the reimbursement. So as for in Malaysia, the policy reimbursement is, uh, is more towards CAPD and very limited to APD. CAPD is a manual procedure. It does not attach to a machine and you can do it in any clean environment. So if you can see here, focus on the photo that, that just appeared uh, with uh, this uh, blue bar. So one bar represents one exchanges. So from here, you can see that once the PD, once patient connected to the system, the PD fluid will uh, fill in uh, fill in into the, the, the abdominal cavity and this part we call as a fill-in process. Then uh, after that, patient can actually disconnect 
and the PD fluid will remain in the abdominal cavity for four to six hours to do the exchanges or dialysis. So during these four to six hours, they are free to do their daily activity and come back after six hours to drain out the uh, the dialysis. And the procedure will actually go in, fill in, dwell and out uh, at maximum of four exchanges a day. And uh, basically, with a good tank of uh, function, tank of uh, function, the process of fill in and fill out it takes about fifteen to twenty minutes. For automated peritoneal dialysis, uh, the difference is that they use a portable machine, and usually the dialysis will be uh, done at night with total duration about eight to ten hours, and patient usually will be free during the daytime without any dialysis. And uh, this is a concept for automated peritoneal analysis. There's no dialysis during the daytime, so they can just do their own activities. And after they are settling with their uh, dinners or prayers, and before they go to sleep, they will actually do their exchanges. So in one pyramid in APD, we call it as a cycler. So we can set up through the machine um, on how long the duration the, and the total volume and it will and also the numbers of cycler in which will automatically appear uh, or set up through the machine. And a good thing about automated APD is that um, uh, in one of uh, the uh, Baxter actually produced a modem connected to modem whereby we can actually uh, where we where where there's a remote home monitoring. So what is remote patient uh, monitoring? So it is a technology for monitoring and managing patient care remotely with the ability to make changes to patient therapy. So for example, patient is doing dialysis at home. We as a healthcare provider will actually review or log into the system and we will review the dialysis uh, data of the patients. And if there's a pitfall or if there's changes that we need to make uh, through the prescription, we can actually adjust it remotely uh, through the system without patient need to come to the hospital. So along with the PD modality, of course, we need a solutions to do uh, for the small solutes and also ultrafiltration removal. So uh, we have conventional PD solutions and also biocompatible PD solutions. So conventional PD solution utilize low molecular weight glucose as the only osmotic agent and are available in three different glucose concentrations. So in Malaysia, we use 1.5, 2.3 or 2.5 and 4.25%. So the higher the percentage, the higher the glucose concentration. So it is actually cheap and uh, mostly used worldwide. It is efficient, safe and readily metabolized. However, it has high acidic pH uh, and also lactate like as a buffer and relatively high concentration of GDPs. It can impact peritoneal post -def defense and in the long run, it can lead to peritoneum uh, fibrosis and later encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis. And uh, to reduce the non-pharmacological effect of the conventional PD solutions, biocompatible PD solutions were introduced. However, uh, it is more more costly as compared to conventional and not uh, um, not many of us have uh, the ability to use biocompatible PD. So the biocompatible PD which are available are icodextrin. Uh, we do have it in Malaysia. The low glucose degradation product which produced by FMC, which uh, which called as balance, amino acid neutrinil, and also a uh, normal pH of uh, solution uh, we call as fissionil. And potential benefit of biocompatible PD solution have been reported as it reduced glucose exposure. There's a potential to improve membrane viability. It preserves ultrafiltration capacity. It delayed time to anuria. It also improves nutritional status and prolonged PD technique survival. So once we already decide on the PD modality, of course, we need to decide on the number of exchanges and the volume that we need to give. So, um, PD can be prescribed in a variety of ways, either to use standard peritoneal dialysis prescription or incremental PD prescription. So for CAPD, it is always have been four exchanges every day, four to six hours of dwell per exchange and seven days a week. And for APD prescription, the full dose, the standard full dose in my setting in, in Malaysia is uh, delivered of uh, 10 litre, with night dwell of 8 to 10 hours, 
uh, in seven days a week. However, in most high-income countries, it has been at least eight liter delivered at night by cycler uh, over eight hours and at least one or two long dwell seven days a week. So and you can see in the calendar, okay, the, the, the routine, you can see at the clear is full, every day is full with peritoneal dialysis exchanges. So that is for standard PD. But the question now, does uh, new patients who initiate PD require high dose or full dose peritoneal dialysis? So Dugidas et al. actually has reported that more frequent PD or HD did not improve clinical outcome, more frequent and lengthy dialysis may even accelerate residual renal function decline. Thus, incremental dialysis should be considered as initial PD prescription. So what is incremental PD? Incremental PD refers to a strategy of prescribing less than the standard full dose of PD when initiating PD so that the combination of residual kidney function and peritoneal clearance is sufficient to achieve individual life clearance goals. And, of, and incremental PD can be prescribed in several ways, including varying down the numbers of exchanges per day, numbers of PD days per week, meaning that we give PD holiday for patients, dwell volume per exchange or as a combination of all these approaches. So in my uh, clinical uh, setting, uh, these are few uh, examples uh, of incremental uh, prescription that I use on my, uh, my clinical uh, practice. So because uh, we've uh, limited to APD, we are more uh, using CAPD. So one of the examples are using CAPD three exchanges a day with all conventional PD dialysis. Or if the patient has a financial to ipodextrin, we will put patient ipodextrin at night. So this can be used to a patient who actually uh, who, who actually work for up to 3 p.m. And uh, once they arrive home, they can do the subsequent exchanges. Or a worker who actually have who work from 8 to 5 p.m. but there's available uh, area, clean area for, for them to do the exchanges. And this can be done with a PD holiday. Another, another way that you can do uh, is three exchanges. Uh, but and if the patient has financial support for icodexin, and uh, we usually we also can give icodextrin uh, long dwell during uh, the daytime. So this usually we will give to a patient or individual uh, who or assistant who work from eight a.m. to five p.m. And this also can be given with or without PD holiday. Uh, PD with partial dry day, whereby they can actually uh, start their dialysis uh, at noon once they are at home. And this usually apply to patients who, uh, who work uh, shift hours, such as factory worker or healthcare worker. And this also can be given uh, with or without PD uh, holiday. And in some uh, some patients, uh, special patients, I do sometimes give single overnight or day daytime exchange, either with conventional or icodextrin, to individuals who has not much issue with solute clearance or fluid or vice versa. It's just that to keep patient comfort, example, in patient elderly or patient with hepatorenal syndrome and cardiorenal syndrome that we initiated early uh, and we start incremental to keep them comfort, uh, to, to prevent, uh, to keep them comfort from fluid overload. So for APD prescription incremental dialysis, it could vary based on the nights in a week, uh, based on the volume and based on the hours of the treatment. And if you can see in the calendar, it's no, more, no longer uh, of uh, PD, uh, PD photos here, but at least they have a PD holiday so that they can rest, they can do whatever activities that, that they like, like shopping or hiking or do their um, sports. However, not all patients is suitable for incremental dialysis as, as it requires significant residual kidney function, 
and it would not be appropriate for patients with no residual kidney function. It requires clinical judgment based on patient body size and dialysis requirements, other metabolic controls, the ability to achieve adequate volume control, likelihood of adherence to treatment, diet and fluid restriction, and patient must be willing to convert to full dose PD or intensification of treatment when residual kidney function falls. So the advantages of incremental PD uh, is uh, mostly actually described in a small observational study uh, with a single center and a small numbers of patients, not much of randomized control trial. So the potential advantage that have been reported are preservation of residual kidney function, uh, potential to prolong peritoneal dialysis survival, a good psychosocial impact, and also it is good for economy and also environment. So this is just uh, data from our PD unit that we've recently uh, um, analyzed, uh, whereby uh, just to show that, you know, uh, we have 155 patients and the data is collected from January 2020 to December 2022. We have 74 patients underwent incremental PD, 77 patients underwent standard PD. So if you can see here at two years, uh, the residual uh, urine is higher in uh, incremental uh, PD as compared to normal PD. And you can see also at one year of treatment, there's a significant numbers of uh, residual uh, urine as compared to incremental PD. So that's a potential preservation of residual in the urine with using incremental dialysis. And, and the only ra uh, randomized control trial on incremental dialysis done in 2019 in China, uh, for where they collected PD patients from 2007 to 2015, 127 patients underwent incremental dialysis. And what they have found that incremental PD group was associated with significant lower risk of developing anuria. Patient survival, technique survival, and peritonitis free survival were all similar between this group. For psychosocial uh, impact, less onerous prescription might allow for less anxiety and stress starting PD, more time for patients to build confidence, more per person-centered approach, greater simplicity and less workload for the patient or their caregivers, and it facilitates better adherence. In terms of prolonged peritoneal dialysis survival, fewer daily PD exchange and or lower dwell volume results in reduced peritoneal glucose exposure with potentially fewer adverse local and systemic effects. Lower dwell volume leads to lesser intraperitoneal pressure, thus reduced mechanical side effects such as back pain, abdominal fullness and heartburn. Fewer daily PD involves, so a fewer connection has been done, so there's a reduced risk of peritonitis. So in a specific population such as heart failure, cardiorenal syndrome, start, uh, they, they actually start early uh, for uh, uh, by using incremental dialysis and what they have found that left ejection fraction had improved significantly and 90% reduction in hospitalization. In terms of economy and environment, um, it is less costly than the standard one because less solution is required. Uh, it has been reported CAPD with three dwells cost 25% less than CAPD with four dwells daily. And 80% of carbon footprint comes from packaging material. So with incremental PD, it reduces the use of PD carbon footprint. Of course, with, with the, all the advantages, it also uh, has their own disadvantages in which once you start on incremental PD, patients need, be, need to be frequent follow-up, monitoring of residual kidney function and prescription adjustment. There's a possible risk of uremia, hypovolemia, or other dangerous electrolyte disturbances if timely prescription adjustment is not made. Incremental PD patients may be reluctant to increase prescription thus as kidney function decline. So when you want to start incremental PD for a patient, this needs to be actually primed and highlighted and stressed to the patient on uh, the frequent follow-up and the risk of uh, changing to standard PD. So we have covered on uh, PD modality and also PD prescription. Next, we will go to the follow-up and how we revise the prescription. So in our clinical setting, follow-up, if we start incremental, uh, we will actually follow up early, which is two weeks after training. Subsequently, we review for four to six weeks for a few times. 
and if stable we will actually follow up about three to four monthly so during the follow-up we will access the dialysis adequacy we will actually try to introduce lifetime medication to complement the PD prescription. And this needs to involve multidisciplinary team, which uh, involve dietitian, our PD nurses, pharmacists, and sometimes they need a psychologist uh, assessment. And it's also important to revise the prescription if needed. So for adequacy, uh, as mentioned by the ISB 2020, it is uh, important uh, once patients sit down and see you to actually look at their quality uh, of life, how actually uh, their general well-being when they initiated on PD, can they cope doing the exchanges? Uh, can they still do uh, uh, their activities before, uh, before like, like, you know, uh, they can they still work in, they can do their favorite uh, sports on, etc. And other adequacy is actually more or less similar with hemodialysis, whereby we look at the clinical parameters on the anemia, anemia mineral bone disease, fluid electrolytes, and also blood pressure and nutrition. And we still do uh, 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 K-table AV and baseline PET after six weeks of initiation of PD. Okay, for lifestyle modification to complement PD prescription, it will involve a dietitian whereby patient will be advised to take enough calorie and enough protein diet. We will actually teach patient in terms of their weight monitoring. We will encourage patients to do physical activity and the care. We advise on the care on the uh, PD catheter while they do the physical activity. We will also, also actually advise on volume control emphasize on the uh, hygiene, emphasize to prevent constipation, and we will also remind patient if they plan to travel, they have to actually to con need to contact us so that we can actually modify the prescription based on their traveling time. Okay, so uh, next is revising prescription. Um, if patient have suboptimal solute clearance, we can increase volume by 20 to 30% or we can increase exchanges if volume is maximum or adjust on the dwell time. And if the patient is on APD, we can consider daytime dwell. If the patient is fluid overload, of course, you need to access the residual urine, maximize diuretics. You can go, for example, you can go fusuma, you can go up to 120 milligram TDS, or sometimes we can add other, uh, other diuretics such as uh, metalazone, uh, advice on salt and water restriction, and I advise patients to take high protein diet, use icodextrin if it's, it's available. If not, if you have to use hypertonic solution to prevent fluid overload, by all means, please use it and also reduce dwell time. However, before you're revising this prescription, you have to make sure patient is compliant to the treatment. Okay, let's go back to the case discussion earlier. So if you remember a teacher who actually crash land with uremia, so what is the initial PD prescription would you recommend? A, CAPD-4 exchanges daily. Um, uh, the reason be I didn't put her on CAPD-4 exchanges daily because number one, she's still working. Number two is that she has still have a lot of residual urine. So I put her on incremental dialysis. So which incremental dialysis that I would like to choose? Either B, C, D, and E. Um, yep, for it. B is also suitable for her. However, uh, we have uh, issues in terms to get uh, automated parental dialysis from Ministry of Education. And also, there's no financial issue for iCodexing for her. So after discussion, uh, she and uh, our team agreed to put her, her on CAPD, uh, three exchanges per day, five days in a week. And she's doing well until now. So uh, for the second case, a uh, 55-year-old who is actually still active, who refused to put to, to have a dialysis during the daytime, uh, what are the adjustments would you make to the PD prescription? So the main problem with this patient is inadequate dialysis. So uh, to, to, to increase the solute clearance, what we did is that we increased the number to five cyclers with eight hours treatment, increase the volume to 2,000 mils for each cycler. So I think we have covered on the principle of a initial PD prescription and subsequent follow-up. And in summary, PD prescription is like an art. 
it, you need to craft it based on each individual characteristic to maintain their clinical well-being, quality of life, ability to meet life goals, and at the same time to minimize the treatment burden. And I would encourage all my friends in Indonesia and all in also in Malaysia to start to use utilize incremental dialysis in your uh, clinical practice for patients who still have good residual kidney function. And uh, and please uh, utilize lifestyle modification uh, as one of the important aspects to incorporate it, uh, to be incorporated during the uh, during the initial PD prescription. So before I end my lecture, I would like to invite all my friends in this webinar to join us on 14th MSN PD Masterclass, which uh, the theme this year is about high skill, high growth in peritoneal dialysis, which will be at Sheraton Kuala Lumpur on 25th to 26th November 2023. So if you are interested, you can actually scan the QR code below the poster here and we will actually circulate time to time, time to time. Okay, with this, I end my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Wan. This nice presentation, very basic. Um, okay, I remind for participants who want to ask questions, please to write in the Queen's question and answer in the box. Okay, next. Presentation will be Dr. Nimadi Hostrini. She will talk about PD related infection, prevention, and management. Please, Dr. Nimadi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Atma, for the kind introduction. Uh, and I would like also to express my gratitude to ISPD and also Panafri for such a wonderful opportunity to present on this STEAM webinar. And now I will try to focus on the prevention strategies as well as management of PD-related infections. Um, ladies and gentlemen, PD-related infection continue to be a serious complications for PD patients. And as shown in this uh, figure, the, the episode of staph aureus infection is improving in one center in the US whom practicing optimal continuous quality improvement program or CQI program. But in general, the risk of infection in PD is not falling. Uh, as in other parts of the world, infection also continues to be the second most common cause of death in PD. And peritonitis also continues to be the leading cause of technic failure and for years has been leading cause of hospitalization. Therefore, to improve outcomes in PD patient, attention must be focused on preventing peritonitis. PD-related infection can occur at any level or any segment of PD catheter, whether it is, it is an exit site infection or tunnel infection, or worse, it can hit as an peritonitis. As on the last updated ISPD guideline on the catheter-related infection this year, exit site infection is defined as the presence of purulent discharge with or without erythema of the skin at the catheter epidermal interface, and a tunnel infection diagnosed when evidence the presence of clinical inflammation with or without ultrasound evidence of a fluid collection anywhere along the catheter tunnel. The diagnosis of exit site infection is mostly clinical and should be considered whenever uh, there is a change from the patient normal healthy exit site. The, the diagnosis can also be challenging as pericatheter erythema without purulent discharge can be observed from allergic skin reaction in the setting of a recently placed catheter or following trauma to the catheter or after a change in the dressing or cleansing material. Sometimes erythema alone may be an indication of early infection needing close monitoring for development of purulent discharge and need for antimicrobial treatment. A positive culture with a normal appearing exit site for instance, without purulent discharge is an indication for colonization rather than a true infection. And the cause of a catheter-related infection can be broadly divided according to the organisms to guide treatment. And the most commonly isolated organism reported for the exit site infection in a mupirocin and polysporin triple or MP3 RCT were diphtheroid for 20%. Staph aureus for 13% and Pseudomonas for 13.6% and fungus of almost 10%.
In an RCT comparing topical application of mupiricin for cystentomycin at the exit site, the most commonly reported organism in the mupiricin arm was Staph aureus and other gram-positive organism and Pseudomonas. There were fewer gram-positive and gram-negative exit site infection, but more yeast infection in the gentamicin group. And it is likely that the epidemiology of organism will vary according to the region, prophylaxis approach, antibiotic usage, and so on. A PD, a PD catheter insertion related exit site and or tunnel infection, also defined in the last uh, ISPD guidelines, is defined as an episode of exit site infection or tunnel infection that occur within 30 days after PD insertion. And prevention of catheter related infection is, is based on uh, four recommendations on catheter placement. First, Prophylactic antibiotic be administered immediately before cat insertion for prevention of peritonitis and the use of nasal antibiotic prophylaxis if patients are identified as being uh, nasal staph aureus carriers on screening prior to PD cat insertion. And to choose a uh, PD cat placement technique should be left to this shared decision making between the individual clinician and patient. And the exit site dressing should be left intact for seven days after PD cat insertion, unless it's soiled, to immobilize the new cat and reduce the risk of infection. PD programs should implement a standard rice training for trainers and also patients in the PD unit. However, currently there is no clear evidence to inform the best way to deliver training in terms of place, person, or approach, including the optimal nurse to patient ratios. PD training has shown to be uh, play a pivotal role to decrease the risk of catheter-related infection. A single center observational study from UK had observed a tenfold reduction in the burden of exit site infection after implementing a preventive program pro focusing on training the nurses and patients, improving operative aseptic technique and reducing staff audios nasal carriage. The training curriculum also also advised to incorporate general theories as adult learner learning principles and research is underway to identify how to best deliver training incorporating an adult learning theory based curriculum and a dedicated nurse to support individual patient training focusing on adherence to guideline and antiseptic procedures is also recommended and following a completion of pd training a home visit by PD nurse is recommended to identify any environmental issues that may affect the risk of infection, as well as confirm ongoing adherence to protocols and also acceptable standard of exchange technique. An RCT of 104 incident patients from Korea showed that implementing frequent retraining in incident PD uh, will decrease the incidence of exit site over 24 months compared to the control groups. And the recommendation for exit site care is daily topical application of antibiotic cream or ointment, uh, should be mopiracin or gentamicin to the cat access, exit site. And uh, daily applications of mopiracin to the exit site has been shown to be a cost-effective strategy to decrease the risk of end exit site, especially from staph aureus. In this systematic review, application of mupiracin was reported to reduce the risk of in exit site infection by 62%. And however, a recent systematic review of meta-analysis of six uh, RCTs demonstrated that there was an uncertain uh, whether the application of mupiracin uh, prevent exit site infection. But this analysis is limited by the high level of heterogeneity, heterogeneity between the studies. And, and then the exit site be cleansed at least twice weekly and every after shower or active exercise. And PD cat exit site should be continued after interruption or discontinuation of PD as long as the catheter remain in place. A dressing cover over the exit site is not mandatory after exit site care and topical antibiotic application. And lastly, the PD catheter be immobilized to avoid traction injury of the exit site. The measurement of PD exit site infection is summarized on this figure. Culture swab uh, should be taken from an exit site with prurent discharge after examination of the 
exit side, the tunnel catheter should be inspected and palpated and tenderness over the catheter pathway and drainage from the exit side after milking the trap would indicate tunnel infection, which if untreated can progress to abscess formation or cat-related peritonitis. And then ultrasound examination can be helpful to, to detect tunnel infection. Empirical antibiotic treatment for exit time infection with appropriate staph ovarius coverage, such as first generation of uh, capillosporin or anti staphylococcal penicillin, or unless patient has a prior infection or colonization with MRSA or uh, Pseudomonas uh, species. In this case, a glycopeptide uh, such as vancomycin or clindamycin uh, or anti pseudomonal antibiotic are appropriate. And definitive antibacterial meat treatment um, and duration are best guided by clinical response and when available results of wound culture and susceptibility. Refractory uh, site infection should raise uh, the suspicion of atypical organisms such as non-tuberculosis mycobacteria. And this is the algorithm of tunnel infection. More prolonged antibiotic therapy is required uh, when uh, there are complicated conditions such as tunnel infection, and there is no RCT evidence to guide treatment duration for tunnel infection. So they recommended for at least uh, three weeks treatment of effective antibiotic was assigned to a 1D uh, level, 1 delta molecule. And here is the dosing recommendation for frequently used oral antibiotic for first line or alternative oral antibiotics. A surgical intervention might be the choice if we are dealing with these clinical indica indications such as catheter infection occurring simultaneously with peritonitis or catheter infection leading to peritonitis or there is a refractory catheter infection. And next I will talk on the management of PD peritonitis. And the episode of uh, PD peritonitis is decreasing over time and this is based on the US RDS annual report it is decreasing for from 13.4 events per person years in 2010 down to 5.4 events per person years in 2020. But why do we still have to worry about this PD peritonitis? Well, this study shows that peritonitis continues to be the leading cause of death, hospitalization, and technical failure causing transfer to HD. And there are well-known risk factors for peritonitis, such as the non-modifiable, such as older age, female, race, black, uh, lower economic social status, and so on, and also modifiable risk factors that we can uh, also modify. And ISPD has recently published the recommendation for prevention and treatment of PD peritonitis, so it's last year. And um, this is to summarize uh, the guidelines uh, recommendations. So for any uh, diagnosis of peritonitis, it is recommended to be based on cause-specific organism, cause-specific peritonitis, <clears throat> excuse me. A culture negative peritonitis is defined when peritonitis is diagnosed, but no organism is identified on culture of diocese effluent. And culture negative Peritonitis can be due to infectious or non-infectious causes. For example, infectious cause uh, <clears throat> may occur in the context of recent antibiotic exposure, suboptimal sample collection, or uh, culture method or misclassification from slowly growing atypical organisms such as mycobacteria or fungus. And non-infectious causes may include eosinophilic or uh, chemical such as icodextrin, uh, but neutrophil predominance of the elevated white blood cell that might not be present. And catheter-related peritonitis can be diagnosed with a high degree of certainty when it occurs concomitantly with an exit site or a tunnel infection. And peritonitis from uh, enteric causes, uh, such as from strangulated bowel, ischemic colitis, appendicitis, can cause a diagnostic challenge. And identification of multiple organisms, particularly both gram-positive and negative, is only net suggestive of enteric cause for peritonitis. Enteric, enteric peritonitis can present as culture negative if the process involves the peritoneal membrane through a contagious, an infectious, inflammatory in reaction such as uh, pancreatitis. 
The ISPD guideline recommend that every program should monitor the incidence and outcome of peritonitis annually, with the overall peritonitis rate should no more than 0.4 episode per patient per year at risk, and the proportion of culture-negative peritonitis should be less than 15% of all episodes of uh, peritonitis. And this figure also summarizes the standard recommendation for prevention of peritonitis, where systemic <clears throat> Prophylactic antibiotic be administered immediately prior to catheter placement, any wet contamination to the PD system prior to colonoscopy, an invasive gynecological procedure, and uh, the patient should keep the abdomen empty before the endoscopic gastrointestinal and invasive or instrumental gynecological procedure. An optimization of PD training program uh, should be regularly assessed it, uh, for the exchange technique and also knowledge. And PD patients should be asked about their pads during the training and also during home visit and take extra precaution to prevent peritonitis if domestic pads are kept. Pads are not allowed in the room where PD exchange take place and where dialysis tubing equipment and machine are stored. And also avoidance uh, and treatment of hypokalemia and also avoiding or limiting the use of histamine 2 receptor antagonists to prevent enteric peritonitis. To prevent fungal peritonitis, antifungal prophylaxis be co-prescribed whenever PD patient receive an antibiotic course, regardless to the indication of that antibiotic course. And PD retraining is recommended for some clinical uh, conditions such as following prolonged hospitalization, following peritonitis and or cat infection, following change in dexterity, fission or mental equity, and following change to another supplier or a different type of connection, following change in caregiver for PD exchange, or following other interruption in PD, such as a period of time of uh, transfer to hemodialysis. So our patient is a male, 48 years old, presented with this cloudy effluent, as you can see on the right, but uh, present with no abdominal, abdominal pain or fever. He had this kidney failure for five years and initiated with HD for the first time for one year and then transferred to CAPD for the last four years. He was uh, uh, failing the kidney for, because of chronic GN. So how to diagnose of uh, peritonitis? That's the patient. Uh, conclude the criteria for peritonitis. So uh, diagnosing PD peritonitis, um, at least you need two of the following of present. So clinical features consistent with peritonitis, uh, such as abdominal pain, like in this patient, and or uh, cloudy or di uh, cloudy dialysis effluent. And dialysis effluent uh, white cell count should be more than 100 uh, per microliters after a dwell time of at least two hours with more than 50% PMN or polymorphonuclear and or a positive dialysis uh, effluent culture. And you need to remember that not all abdominal pain or cloudy effluent is peritonitis. Um, here are the differential diagnosis of cloudy uh, effluent, including cellular causes and non-cellular causes. And uh, how to evaluate a uh, patient for uh, PD peritonitis? As usual, we should do from uh, the patient history, whether there's a cloudy PD effluent or abdominal pain, and uh, we still can uh, suspect it. This is a peritonitis, even uh, there is, uh, the effluent is clear, but patient uh, presented with abdominal pain. And then uh, there, there was a recent contamination uh, to the PD system, especially wet contamination, accidental disconnection, or another procedure, invasive procedure, and then present with constipation or diarrhea, or past history of peritonitis or exit site infection. On physical examination, you will find abdominal tenderness, typically it's generalized, localized pain or tenderness, you should seek for a surgical pathology, and you should also uh, inspect carefully the catheter tunnel and exit site. And uh, you see if there are any discharge from the exit site and then should be cultured. For the lab, uh, we need uh, dialysis effluent analysis for cell count with differential and gram scale and culture. A result of the uh, white blood cell more than 100 uh, cells per microliters for at least a dwelling time, two hours, with more than 50% of PMN. And uh, 
special consideration in APD patient because um, the patient, especially patient with rapid cycle, we do not uh, uh, use the total cell count, but we can use the percentage of uh, polymorphonuclear uh, or we patient APD patient without day dwell, we could use uh, one liter of dialysis solution should be infused and well for one to two hours and then drain for uh, another analysis and <clears throat> for uh, the abdominal x-ray is generally not necessarily uh, because it can sometimes uh, conflict with other uh, hemato uh, pneumoperitoneum and uh, peripheral blood culture is not necessarily unless patient is septic or uh, any other condition And this is the algorithm for initial management for PD patient, uh, as in the older guidelines, still the same. And we give uh, empirical antibiotic as soon as possible, and then see uh, the culture and then readjust the treatment. And what will you do with this patient? Well, PD patient presenting with cloudy effluent should be presumed to have peritonitis and treated as such until the diagnosis can be confirmed or excluded because PD effluent and then PD effluent be tested for cell count, differential, glum stain and culture when it, whenever peritonitis is uh, suspected. And don't wait too long to give antibiotic. This is a prospective study of 116 patients with 159 episodes of peritonitis in Australia and they uh, measured the uh, symptom to contact time, and then symptom to treatment time, and then contact to treatment time. And uh, contact to treatment time that was uh, found independently associated with PD failure and risk for PD failure increased by 5.5% for each hours of delay of administration of antibiotics. And use the uh, route for intraperitoneally uh, rather than IV unless the patient uh, is uh, sepsis. So this is the a study that uh, supported this evidence. And why do we choose IP? Because the possibility of home antibiotic administration by trained patient and avoidance of IV access, a new access for the patient, and could deliver a high concentration of antibiotic to the peritoneum. Uh, when we do IV route, then we should question the efficacy, not as well as uh, the IP. And then uh, PD trained staff, uh, but uh, there is some benefit like PD trained staff are not readily available in the ER, so uh, they could just, uh, you know, uh, ask for help and uh, uh, available nurse and then faster administration. And also, you should dose and choose antibiotics correctly, like for gram positive, first generation uh, caposporin or vancomycin, and for gram negative, you should choose the third generation of caposporin or aminoglycoside. And things to consider to choose antibiotic is the residual kidney function. When the patient has a significant residual kidney function, then you have to adjust the dose, maybe raising, uh, reducing the dose. Uh, and then you should uh, consider the modality, the therapeutic concentration maintained, choosing the right antibiotics and whether it's con intermittent or continuous on CAPD. Yeah. Uh, differing from CAPD and APD, in APD, uh, the, they have greater peritoneal antibiotic clearance that causing subtherapeutic antibiotic levels. So whether switching APD patient to CAPD to ensure adequate levels of antibiotic, it, this is still con uh, uh, controversial. And if antibiotic needs to be given continuously, APD will need to be switched to CAPD. And also we could see some level of antibiotics when they're available uh, laboratory. And there are some management uh, also algorithm for staff aureus, uh, so cost-specific peritonitis stated in this guideline. So um, mostly it's uh, the same, but you should see the uh, course of antibiotics and also uh, for the uh, strep uh, aureus, uh, you should um, also train for 14 days. And this is for the gram-positive organism, uh, including coagulase negative stuff on culture. And then uh, for enterococcus species, 
you should consider whether this is single or polymicrobial and then adjust the antibiotics and treat for 21 days. And for non-fermenting or environmental gram-negative bacteria, uh, such as Pseudomonas, uh, you should give a longer antibiotic for uh, 21 days. And then for enteric gram-negative bacteria, also uh, we should uh, consider a, a wider spectrum of antibiotic, including carbapenem. And for polymicrobial peritonitis uh, with multiple gram-negative or gram-positive, uh, you can see the algorithm here. And also for fungal uh, peritonitis, uh, the choice is to remove the PD catheter as soon as possible and give uh, antifungal uh, orally or IV. For culture negative, uh, you continue initial uh, therapy, but in day three, still negative, but uh, with clinical improvement, uh, discontinue gentamicin and continue with capasolim, but with no clinical improvement, then uh, you need to have a special culture technique and then uh, adjust the treatment accordingly. And for the uh, relapsing, recurrent, and repeated peritonitis, uh, they recommend to uh, timely uh, removal of the PD cath and simultaneous PD cath removal and reinsertion be considered after the culture of PD effluent has become negative and the PD effluent white cell count is below 100 uh, cells per microliters in the absence of concomitant exit site or tunnel infection. And this is my last slide uh, for the summary. Infectious complication is still a major burden in managing PD patient. Infectious complication can occur in every catheter segment and peritonitis is one of the most uh, common infectious complication. Aggressive prevention strategies should be implemented to decrease a potentially preventable adverse event and achieve improved outcome. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Nimadi. Nice presentation, very, very complete and clear. Okay, we will have a discussion for around 20 minutes. And now we have seven questions and okay, we'll, for Dr. Wan, there is one question. This question is about the time for start for PD. Is it for PD or maybe bit, still better for long time on HD, HD and then switch to PD? Please, okay. Dr. Wang. Okay, thank you for the questions. So when is the right time to do CAPD? So basically, uh, um, based on this, there's no fix. Uh, numbers or on when or EGFR when to start CAPD. In fact, in ideal study, uh, randomized control trial looking at uh, EG, lower EGFR which is less than seven or higher EGFR which is less than twelve. There's no difference in terms of survival or mortality rate. So you 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 need to time uh, our uh, you need to have a structured program for to time uh, uh, to timely. Uh, start renal replacement therapy. So um, in, in my clinical setting, what I we have is that we have a pre-dialysis clinic and we will actually uh, uh, do a PD assessment who are interested with doing PD and we will uh, give a tank off date, which is uh, when the EGFR uh, less than 10 and also we will correlate with clinical parameters and also volume status. And of course, if if patient is diabetic with very bad nephropathy, we will start early when the EGFR is even more than 10, about less than 12 or 13. So for the case, for the second question, is the first time having been diagnosed with CKD, is the, this the first time having been diagnosed with CKD or is it good for HD patients who have been around for a long time? So a difference between HD and PD, uh, we can see that 
PD actually um, preserve your residual urine uh, function more as compared to hemodialysis because in hemodialysis, once you start, it involves your blood. So it will reduce perfusion to your kidney and it, it will affect your remaining nephron. So it, it, it has been shown that in, in, in a studies saying that, you know, the two years uh, 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 remaining residual urine function do actually uh, have better survival as compared to uh, in PD as compared to HD. So of course, uh, CAPD is, is a better choice, okay, uh, being a pro PD. And, uh, and we do also have patients who have a vascular access issue actually turn out to be, uh, to be need to be on uh, CAPD. Uh, of course, their quality of life would be as good as if you start with CAPD and the prescription will be high dose as compared to if you start with PD itself. And I hope I answer the questions. Second question, Dr. Watt. When prescribed incremental PD, when to examine PAT test, and do we still reach catheography 1.7 in incremental PD? Well, um, when I prescribe incremental PD, we just do a baseline uh, KT over PET. Uh, after six weeks, uh, patient is stable, uh, initiating the, the 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 regime with the regime. Uh, we don't really routinely do KT over PET test nowadays. It is basically based on uh, the physician orders. As uh, we are moving away, as you know that you know we are not looking solely at the KT over itself. Uh, do we still aim KT over more? 1.7 in incremental PD, um, based on the study, your KTOVV will be high if your residual urine is still available or a lot. So in incremental PD, I don't really aim KTOVV more than 1.7. I look at the general uh, well-being and correlate with the clinical parameters for the adequacy. The third question, in low resources countries where acudextrate and APD is not available, what's your approach for incremental PD? Well, uh, uh, Emilia, you have to actually correlate it with a uh, patient's uh, characteristic. How bad is their solute? What is their body size? How is their patient lifestyle? So, for example, uh, the case that I showed earlier, if uh, she is still working, okay, still working and uh, want to do PD, still want to continue working and wanted to do PD, you can actually try, you can use the conventional peritoneal dialysis uh, solution and you can actually try to uh, accommodate the time of exchanges based on patient uh, working hours. So we have to actually discuss, sit down with patient, discuss with patient and look at how is their lifestyle or working life like? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, to Dr. Nimadi, there is a question about for test peritonitis. There is new devices to check peritonitis by using a uh, point of care test, care test. This one is strip test to check peritonitis. This one is very challenging for uh, long geographically. So what's your opinion, Dr. Nimadi? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Atma. So there are lots of uh, other uh, novel diagnostic techniques. Uh, as we can see from their research, like, uh, numbers of novel diagnostic te techniques such as uh, Reagan strip and then uh, ACEs, some ACEs like... Uh, uh, and gal, procalcitonin, etc. But uh, I don't think it's uh, proven to be superior uh, to the conventional technique. And um, they also uh, develop a, um, algorithm uh, resulting from the mathematical uh, calculation of a machine and then uh, try to uh, specify on what the uh, uh, causal specific like uh, coagulase neg uh, negative stuff or uh, streptococcal species, but uh, I think it needs uh, further research to uh, to come to a, a conclusion, good conclusion. So I don't have a clear uh, 
evidence on the benefit of this uh, test uh, until today. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Madi, if we yeah. remove PD catheter and then when we can reinsert it again? Yeah, uh, thank you. So uh, for the uh, for the removal of the PD catheter can be done if uh, there is a relapsing or refractory uh, PD cat uh, peritonitis. And then uh, we also uh, can remove when there is a fungal infection. Yeah, so recurrent organism relapsing or repeated uh, peritonitis uh, episode uh, uh, should be considered for uh, removal of the catheter. And it could be done uh, uh, simultaneously with the reinsertion of the cat catheter. Uh, after the culture of the PD effluent uh, has been negative and the uh, uh, analysis of the white blood cell of the effluent is below 100 per microliters. And we should ensure that there is no uh, simultaneous exit site, exit site or tunnel infection when we do that. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Madi, the negative culture result is still high and mini center for PD. And this question is, if negative culture, when we suspect this one is due to mycobacterium infection? Yeah, so uh, this is a good question, especially for us in, uh, in uh, endemic uh, geographical for uh, TB. So when there is a refractory peritonitis, more than three uh, weeks of uh, antibiotics, there is no uh, clinical improvement, then we should suspect that there is uh, other, uh, other specific atypical microorganism that is including uh, the mycobacterium. You can also uh, do some tests, uh, such as a, a dialysate uh, fluid uh, PCR test for TB to confirm the diagnosis. Okay, thank you. There is still some question uh, for Dr. Wan. How many days for longest free PD day incremental PD prescriptions? And should we leave some solution in the abdomen during free days? <clears throat> okay. For the question number one, how many days the longest free PD day in incremental PD prescription? Again, it depends on how much is the residual urine function that patient have. How is he uh, he or she clinically, whether she's easily freed overload? And uh, number two is uh, how is he is he or she is hypercatabolic, you need that high high solute. So the longest that I've actually I've uh, tried to on the initiation peritonitis, usually what I do is three three exchanges, uh, CAPD with two days rest, two days of PD holiday. But I do have uh, patients who who just uh, requires three uh, days, I mean four PD holidays, because they still have residual urine function, but the issue is because of uh, the solute clearance. For no day dwell, should we leave some solution in the abdomen? Again, it depends on patient. Some patient is not comfortable uh, to have empty uh, empty abdomen, so we will advise them to keep about 200 to 300 cc of uh, dialysate in the abdomen. This question is still related with uh, incremental PD. If mm -hmm. a patient from conventional PD want to switch to incremental PD, what should be conditions uh, required? Mm. Uh, conventional PD, the ubah menjadi, okay, change to incremental PD. Usually patients on conventional PD, we don't really decrement to incremental PD unless Patients started initial initial phase is uh I mean in at early phase of uh peritoneal dialysis about two to three months whereby you know patient is already on on conventional PD still have good residual urine output and residual urine uh I mean the solute clearance is is not an issue she's not free overload 
then yes, we do actually uh, change from a conventional PD to incremental PD. But this is just for patients who, who actually at few months, one or two months with a good residual renal function uh, without solute clearance, then we actually decrement or to reduce it, reduce the exchanges to incremental PD prescription. But the one that's already one year or two year, usually we just continue with conventional PD prescription. Okay, Dr. Madi, this question is about should we start with pancomycin, pancomycin for every uh, peritonitis? Yeah. So um, there are. Uh, you know, pancomycin is not not easy antibiotic available. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and also uh, more expensive. Yeah. So uh, the the, cho the choice of antibiotic is uh, largely depend on the uh, the culture pattern uh, uh, to the sensitivity and also resistance pattern of uh, the centers. So uh, in our center, we uh, usually for uh, for gram positive coverage for empirical antibiotic, we use uh, capalosporin, uh, cepasolin for first generation. Uh, Capalosporin, uh, and for the gram-negative coverage, we use uh, uh, gentamicin. So that is enough for our centers and uh, showing a, a good clinical outcome. But uh, when um, you uh, want to uh, choose for gram-positive coverage with vancomycin, it is uh, well you can choose it uh, as long as it's available. But um, in our center, we don't uh, a jump to vancomycin for the first choice. Next question is uh, <clears throat> removal catheter. This one is asking why the reason to remove catheter immediately if peritonitis to to fungi or mycobacterium the reason yeah it's uh, because that uh, conventional uh, because the first is the diagnosis of fungal uh, or mycobacterium peritonitis is not uh, easy uh, usually we already tried lots of course of uh, antibiotics uh, empirically or, or we thought that this is a culture negative uh, peritonitis then we try another antibiotics and then uh, but once we um, once we suspected that this is fungal, then uh, we need to remove because the uh, the morbidity and also the uh, death rate because of fungal peritonitis is uh, also high. And uh, in our uh, practice, we uh, commonly have to see whether this patient have a risk factor for fungal uh, peritonitis infection uh, like uh, we can uh, inspect their uh, tooth their, their nails two nails or the fingernails for if there are any onychomycosis uh, that can be uh, infected uh, during the uh, connection to the pd system thank you okay next question in giving antibiotic for peritonitis, do we should give antifungal for every treatment with antibiotic? Um, so yeah, for uh, for example, that uh, when a patient is uh, admitted for uh, respiratory infection such as pneumonia then uh, considered an antifungal uh, uh, prophylaxis uh, if uh, for the for, sorry for the fungal uh, for the fungal uh, antifungal antibiotic anti antifungal for give for antibiotic treatment peritonitis oh, for peritonitis now we don't have to we don't have to unless that uh, there is a very uh, long course of peritonitis. The patient 
uh, doesn't uh, seem to have a clinical significant clinical improvement and uh, we uh, should consider a fungal infection then we can give a, a antifungal treatment and if the especially when the patient uh, do not agree to remove the catheter hmm. okay uh, i i don't really agree uh, um, with, last with... question Okay, please, please, Dr. Rohan. Okay, I don't really agree with the answer of not using prophylaxis uh, once patients of PD peritonitis. They should be on uh, fungal prophylaxis once the patient is on initiating uh, antibiotic for PD peritonitis. And this was explained in our current ISPD, latest ISPD on uh, prevention, uh, uh, on, PD, uh, on management of peritonitis recently in 2022. And uh, there's a study, I think a large trial by uh, our uh, colleague in Thailand, actually look that there's a reduction or reduced risk of a relapse uh, and also peritonitis when you give um, prophylaxis uh, antifungal when patients have uh, PD peritonitis. Okay, last questions for Dr. Wan. Usually how long can incremental PD regime can last before switching to standard PD regime? Mm, again, it's also based on uh, individual uh most of the study says you know some of the study says it's about three or four years uh so um uh, I, I i don't have the exact answer how how many years that actually they can remain uh uh to be on incremental dialysis but if you can see from my observational st study uh from the patients that we recruited from 2020 uh now we have actually uh five or six patients uh, which is still on incremental dialysis after uh, more more than uh, more than three years. Thank you, Dr. Wan and Dr. Nimadi, because the time is uh, up. Uh, once again, I would like to thanks uh, so much to ASPD that's provided this webinar sessions in collaboration with uh, Indonesian Society of Peritoneal Dialysis. And I think the time is uh, offered to Dr. Aida, maybe for closing ceremony, please. Thank you, Dr. Atma. We have great uh, discussion with great uh, speakers. Thank you for both speakers, Dr. Wan and Dr. Nimadi, also for our chairman, Dr. Atma. Thank you, Dr. Susi, for RSPD, and uh, also for all our colleagues for your participation. And see you again on the third webinar on 31st of August. But before closing, I would like to ask Dr. Susi to address a closing remark. Please, Dr. Susi. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I'd also like to thank the speakers. Those were wonderful webinar sessions. Um, I learned quite a bit as I am sure everybody else attending this session. It was great to see a thorough re review of the guidelines. We know that if you are following the ISPD guidelines, outcomes are better in clinical practice. And it was also great to see how if we deliver good, best clinical practices, we can also um, make sure we have good patient-centered care. I thought that was great to see those points covered. Um, I'd also like to, again, thank the Indonesian Society of Nephrology for coordinating these efforts and providing some wonderful speakers. Um, and I, again, as um, uh, mention the third webinar series will be uh, August 31st and at that time um, uh, the topics that will be uh, covered are infrastructure, uh, also running uh, a PD unit and how to involve the nurses in um, PD care. So thank you again. I will um, uh, conclude my remarks and uh, close the session if there are no further comments or questions. Thank you. Good night.